So I wanted to redesign some game desktop icons, and it ended up turning out really, really well. I decided to start with one that really needed it. Just Cause 3 is a game where you swing around and blow up stuff. Literally mix Spider-Man with GTA and you've got a pretty good idea of what it is. I've had a lot of fun with it recently, mainly due to the cool grapple system, and it's just not deserving of an icon such as this. I suppose it's not horrible, but at least up the resolution. But anyways, that proved itself to be a good opportunity to change it up. The grapple system is super fun, and that's what I wanted to center the new icon around. But why did I make a Just Cause 3 logo? <laughs> thank you, thank you everybody. Now the first step to something like this is the modeling process. I started with a cube, and then I scaled it on all sides, I had to rotate it a little bit, and then it came down to the manipulation of the geometry so that I could get a nice little hook on the edge. Perfect. So next I ended up using a subdivision service modifier to kind of crunch it down a little bit, but at first it's going to be way too much, so the way you fix that is just by adding some of these loop cuts and kind of pressing them against each side. I then manipulated these vertices a little bit to kind of give it a little bit of curvature down. I made sure to shade it smooth because otherwise you're going to get a lot of flat geometry. I used this reference image of the grappling hook the entire time. As you can see, it needs to be longer, but again, this is for a desktop icon, so it doesn't need to be completely perfect. This looks good to me, so it's time to start the radio symmetry process. In this case, what I'm going to do is grab it along the x-axis over to the side. I'm going to press Control A and apply all the transforms, and I'm going to shift A to add an empty plane axis. Next, I'm going to go ahead and add an array modifier on the blade, and then I'm going to turn the relative offset to zero on all axes. Next, I'm going to check the box that says object offset and select those plane axes in the center. Now, I'm going to up the count to three and then rotate the plane axes in the center by about 120 degrees. That way, you know that it's going to be perfectly symmetrical across three sides. And the best part is, since we're using a non-destructive workflow, we can move these around after the fact and they'll update based on where the object is in the center. This looks good to me, so now it's off to the next part. Add in a plane and rotate it on the X by 90. Next, you're going to go into the top view and then rotate it so that it kind of faces the gap here. And now it's time to create this curved metal piece between all of the blades. Add a loop cut down the center of this plane, and then what you're gonna do is kind of move it towards the center a little bit. It doesn't need to be very far, but far enough. And so now what I'm gonna do is move each side of the plane along the sides of each blade. Make sure it covers up the appropriate amount. Once you're happy with the shape, what you're gonna do is select the edge in the center and then press Control B to bevel it. You can scroll your mouse wheel to increase the resolution of this bevel so that it's very smooth in the center. When you're happy with the way it looks, you can go ahead and shade the object smooth and add a solidify modifier to it. Give it a bit of thickness, try to make it about the same as the blade's thickness, and then go down to object data and turn on auto smooth under the normals tab. Looking good. Now I'm gonna go ahead and add an array modifier, uncheck relative offset, check object offset, and check the empty in the center. Make sure to apply all the transforms so that there won't be anything weird going on. Now just up the count to three and it should be just in the right place. Now I'm gonna turn on proportional editing up here by pressing the O key and then press G and move the mouse wheel a little bit to further edit the form. Now after just a little bit more editing, I think that's fine. But we need to create the shape towards the bottom because as you can see here, it's not just flat, it goes down to a sharp point. So the way that we're gonna do that is select this bottom vertex here and then I'm going to switch the interpolation here and change it to either sharp or linear depending on how you want it to look. I think I'm going to do linear for mine. Once you're happy with the way that looks, it's time to move on. I think next is a good time to start with the cylinder down here. So all you need to do is press Shift S and cursor to world origin and it'll snap this 3D cursor, well, to the world origin. Next, press Shift A to add in a cylinder, perfect. And I'm gonna move it down a little bit and scale it in a little bit. Now I'm gonna go into face select mode and edit mode and press G and Z to lower it down a bit. Now scale it in because as you can see, it has kind of a tapered look to it. And while we're at it, we're gonna scale the entire thing so that it doesn't interfere with the edges of this object. Now go to object and shade smooth back to, uh, back to normals and auto smooth. And this is starting to look really nice. Now it's time to add the tip of the blade. Go to mesh and add a cone and change the vertices to six because that's all we're gonna need. Move it up a bit and look at it from the top down. Now I'm gonna rotate it so that some of the edges align with the three blades we have here. For the other vertices that are not in line with those blades, I'm just gonna scale them in. Nice, now I'm gonna scale this up a bit until it's about the right size, referencing the photo again. And what I'm about to do is bad topology technically, but unfortunately this quarantine is damaging my ability to care about this or anything else. Press Control B and you'll get a nice looking bevel because otherwise there's gonna be a hard cut down the center and no one wants that. Now I'm gonna cheat a little bit and I'm gonna grab this top vertex and grab it along the Z axis using proportional editing to kind of fix that silhouette. Now just go to Object and Shade Smooth and check Auto Smooth. And well, uh, that, that works. Something else I noticed is that the edges of this metal guard piece do curve. So let's make that happen. 
I'm gonna select each of these vertices. And instead of pressing Control B, which does not work on vertices, I'm gonna press Control Shift B. And the results are perfect. Now there's only one piece of the model left, and that is the cable that runs from the grapple to the wrist piece. So to do that, I'm gonna select this cylinder, press Shift S, go to cursor to select it, add in a cylinder, I'm gonna grab it downwards, scale it in, move it upwards again. I'm gonna go in the face select mode, and I'm just gonna move it downwards a lot. And well, that should be just plenty. And well, what you're looking at right now is the entirety of the modeling that we're gonna to have to do for this object. Now it's all gonna be about materials. I turned it 90 degrees on its side to line up with the camera and then rotated the entire thing on the X axis so that if we look at it from the side, we kind of get a three. It's a stretch, okay? It's a stretch, but it's kind of a three. So let's start making the material for this metal cable. First, I'm gonna smooth it and turn on auto smooth so that you know, it looks really nice. Slide open a new material editor, and I already did this, so I'm not gonna do it again. Basically, I made a wire cable from a texture that I found on cc0textures.com. Excellent, excellent website. I'll link it in the description. You've got to check it out. They've got some of the best textures out there. I'll go ahead and remake some of it for you. Basically, you're gonna drag in a color, a metalness, a normal, and a roughness, and a displacement texture. Now, go ahead and delete the displacement texture because we only needed it in the system. So now you're gonna go ahead and grab the color output and drag it into the base color input of the principal BSDF. This is all in the shader editor, by the way. If you're looking for more tips on the shader editor, I just made a video where I explained every single node, so you should probably check that out. Next up is the metalness, and you're gonna make sure the color space is set to non-color because this isn't meant to be used as color, it's just meant to be used as a mask of sorts. So plug the color of metalness into the metallic input, same with the normal, same with the roughness. Make sure they're all non-color, Roughness goes into the roughness input. Normal actually goes into a normal map and then a normal input. But now comes the real challenge and that is the displacement map. So the way that I like to do things and I've kind of just become accustomed to this way of doing it is first having some even topology. So I like to add some loop cuts and then add a displace modifier. Now check new and go to the properties and then click this drop down and find your rope displacement. Now here's the tricky part. We need to make sure to UV unwrap this correctly because right now that's just inappropriate. So press tab to go into edit mode and press U project from view. Now, go to the UV editor so that we can see how this is being mapped on. Right now, not so hot, but if you scale it in the UV editor, we'll start to encompass more of the texture, and well, that's all that matters. So make sure that in your displacement modifier, you turn the color space back to non-color, and then in the actual modifier, change the texture coordinates to UV. Perfect. Now you're gonna make sure to add a subdivision surface before the displace, and then offset it a little bit so that it doesn't interfere. Make sure to upscale the subsurface modifier until your computer is literally screaming in pain, and then bring it down a little bit and give it a break. That's looking good to me for the cable. So now it's time to move on to the others. I ended up creating a joint UV map for all of these by selecting them all, pressing tab, pressing A to select all, and then pressing U and project from view. Very cool. Now you're gonna do pretty much the exact same thing I talked about earlier, except with a new material. And this could be kind of whatever metal material you want it to be. I chose to use this metal plates texture from CC0 Textures, again, love their stuff, so go check it out. And now we're back to the UV editing process. So go into the UV editor, open up the metal plates color texture, or whichever color texture you're using for your material, and then begin selecting individual objects in there, and then dragging it to appropriate spots. See, I, I don't want any of these, I don't want any of these bolts on the tip, so I just drag this UV image down to where just the metal is. And you're gonna use that technique pretty much for the rest of the time. I want bolts on each side of this one, so what I'm gonna do is scale it up until it's right in the correct position. And since I duplicated this, it's going to appear in all the same spots all around. We also have this cool little line in the center as a bonus. Next is a cylinder on the bottom, similar story. I don't want that to have many lines or anything like that. So I just stuck it in the center there and that should be fine. Now let's talk about these fins, blades, I don't even know what to call them at this point. We definitely don't want these bolts out at the top there. So I decided to kind of do the same thing there where I just, where I just kind of stick it in the center so I can make sure to get these awesome metal scratches, but none of the bolts or lines or anything like that. Now the materials on this are pretty much done now, except for the blood. So what I did here is found this blood spotter texture from textures.com and and then comes the complicated part. I go into the mesh data and add another UV map for each of these objects. Now I'm gonna click this camera box next to each of them so that we're looking at whatever is inside of this UV map and not the original. Back in the UV editor, I did a bit of a pro game remove here. I added in that texture as an image node and then used an overlay node to mix the two. I added a mapping node and a UV map node to this texture and made sure that I only use the blood map UV map for mapping this specific texture onto it. As a bonus, I added a color ramp to mask the roughness so that the parts that have blood on them are more glossy. Here's my entire node setup in case you, you care about that. And now what we're gonna have to do is 
select all of them, and then reposition them on the UV map for the blood. Now, I think the tip is fine. I want that to be completely engulfed, but when it comes to the other things, I just want to get the splatter. Now, don't worry if it messes up the mapping of the metal, because we're using a different UV map for that entirely. Now, for the fans or the blades or whatever we're calling these at this point, I, want, I also just wanted to get some splatter. And then for the cylinder down there, I just wanted to get a little drip. Nothing serious. But anyways, this is looking really nice, and so now it's time to switch all of them back to the normal UV map so that we can see the final results of our process. And might I say, this is looking adorable. So now let's talk about rendering. So I made sure to scale it down and tilt it so that it is the shape of a three and it's small enough so that I can affect it with lights and things like that. I'm using a square camera looking directly at it. For lighting, I'm doing two different things, a set of area lights and an HDRI map. I'm using an HDRI that I found on HDRI Haven and then blurred in Photoshop. And then I went into the shader editor and went into the world editor specifically, added a mapping node and changed it to object mapping and plugged that into the HDR. I used this empty sphere as a controller for this HDR so that I could rotate it around and position the lighting so that the brightest part is shining directly on where I'm looking. Now, I used three different area lights that I made rectangular shaped and elongated to cast a bit of a red light on the edges of each of these blades, specifically the parts that are going to form the three, so that it kind of emphasizes it a little bit. Now, make sure to switch to cycles, not to increase the suffering of your PC, but uh, just check this out, it it's awesome. It is beyond awesome. So next I brought it into Photoshop and then I rotated it and scaled it like so. I added in a blue rectangle behind it and then I got the brush tool out and started painting. But once you've got something figured out, this just looks so cool. It's not even worthy of a desktop icon at this point. It should be my background. And as always, you can right click your desktop shortcuts, go to properties and click change icon to search for your icon, but make sure that it's a .ico file. You can use either an online converting service for this or someone told me that you can go on to GIMP and export an IO and use the layers as like multi-resolution so that you can scale the icons up and down and it'll be different resolutions. I'm not that bored yet. I'm close, right? I'm frighteningly close, but not quite. So next I decided to do Minecraft. Minecraft is a game that I have played for quite some time now. It's kind of like a long-term favorite versus the short-term favorite that Just Cause 3 is. Honestly, I love the icon as is just fine, but this more just about adding a personal touch for me as I plan on probably going through and doing all of my icons like this because there's just something about the customization of it that I just really love. So let's talk about Minecraft. I wanted to do this 3D style because I've seen it before on some like random Google images, I don't even know where, but I think it's pretty cool. So I wanted to show you how to do it. So first make sure to delete the default cube vertex by God forsaken vertex, and then go back into object mode and add in a cube. And now we're gonna use this to create the grass block. Head over to the UV editor and see if you can find a texture that has all sides on it. When you've got it, go ahead and drag it into Blender so that you can use it to UV map your cube to. So I'm gonna go ahead, press U. I'm gonna go ahead and choose cube projection so that it's just a bunch of squares. Add in a new material and then use that image texture as the color and then begin by selecting them all and adjusting its placement on this map until it perfectly aligns so that they are all perfect squares. Next, make sure to select the top face and then move that up until it's aligned correctly with the top and then do the same for the bottom. Make sure it's well aligned with the bottom texture. Now that that's out of the way, let's add some loop cuts. You should be adding one less than the total width of pixels. So since this block is 16 by 16 in resolution, you should have 15 loop cuts. Now these may not line up just perfectly if you didn't match your texture perfectly, but it turns out that it's really fine and you won't be able to tell from a desktop icon. But if you do want this to be like perfectly detailed that you're gonna wanna make sure that you map these very, very precisely. Now here's the next thing that I'm gonna do. I'm gonna go into face mode and I'm gonna use this life-saving function up here. Select, select random. It's going to select a random group of faces and then now you can press Alt E, extrude individual faces. Right out of the box, it's looking pretty cool. Only go about half of the extended length, if that makes sense. Go from each side and just kind of randomly select these things. The reason why we're not gonna use the select random function this time is because it's also going to get these little side faces that are gonna extrude the wrong way and it's just gonna be ridiculous. Now you only have to do this from each side that the camera can see, unless you wanna be able to see all six sides. I'm all about shortcuts, I'm all about saving unnecessary time. Sometimes it's inevitable to spend all that extra time, which I understand, but for these purposes, it is most definitely not. And I've got Animal Crossing to play, so. so once you've got all those selected, press Alt E, extrude individual faces, and then go out a little bit further than you did before. Now go into cycles and rendered mode, delete that light. Now you're gonna add a light of your own. Go into the camera's view, add an area light, move it towards the camera's perspective, and drop it directly looking at the cube. 
Now you're going to up the intensity quite a bit. Now make a square camera and change under the camera settings the camera to orthographic. Now change the orthographic scale so that you're right up in the block's face. Save as much room as possible because when you're making an icon that's gonna end up being 64 by 64, every bit of screen, every bit of space counts. Now let's talk about the material. This is gonna be pretty easy. All you need to do is, what I did in this case is lowered the roughness, duplicating the area light, and then focusing it on top of the block and increasing the size. That's something that you do need to do for the other one as well. Increase the size, that way we get even lighting across the whole thing, and then decrease the power of the lamp that you place on top if you even do that at all. Now what I did for the block is I increased the subsurface scattering a lot and then plugged the color into the subsurface color. This gives it kind of a interesting plasticky blurry look that for some reason kind of works well with these icons I've found specifically for this. Now if you do notice any just awful things such as right here you can see that the green is carrying over on this side. That is what we call a UV problem. So if there is something outstanding like that you can just select those specific faces, go into your UV editor and then drag it over to where it should be. But uh, yeah, this is looking good. And and you can do this with pretty much any block block that you can find a texture for. You can add bevel modifiers, you can add a mission. You can make it look cool, make it your own project. And then I always like to bring them into Photoshop and mess with them some more. I just added some contrast here and kind of color graded it a little bit. And then again, right click, properties, change icon, and you can find your icon from there. And so again, nothing wrong with the original icons, it's just a matter of creative expression and something that I wanted to do to customize it. But if you enjoyed this and would like to see more, best way you can support me is leaving a like or subscribing, things like that. It's been a blast everyone, I hope you're staying safe and healthy, happy creating, I'll see y'all later.